That was lovely. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane. We're glad to have you here at UUCS. It is a welcoming congregation and we appreciate your unique background, beliefs, or lifestyle. If you're one of our longtime members or have been here for a short time, or if you're joining us today for the very first time, we're delighted to have you. We also appreciate those of you streaming, or Zooming our services. And I see this morning we have several faces. Could you please introduce yourselves? Okay, I'm Stephen Palmer. I'm the uh, social host for this, this uh, session. And uh, 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 John, why don't you introduce yourself and then pass something, pass it along. Okay, I'm John Smith, Vancouver, BC, and this morning I'm the technical host. So I'll pass on to Terry. I hope we're not too many to be too boring, uh, but uh, I'm Terry Anderson and I'm uh, from Edmonton, and um, I'm glad there's two other volunteers, so I don't have to do anything but enjoy the, the service this morning. And I'll pass it on to Joyce in Port Townsend. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, Joyce Francis in Port Townsend, and I'm grateful to you hosts for doing this every week. It's a great service. Thank you. How about Bill? Un unmute Bill. I'm Bill Morkill. I live in the remote eastern Washington village of Nine Mile Falls. <laughs> And I see that Dick Burkhart's just joined us. Would you say hello to everyone? Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> we seem to be having a little technical problem with, with Dick at the moment with uh, the audio. So uh, well, well. Um, why don't we move along? Uh, we'll hear from Dick later. Okay, welcome. Our church's mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in the wider world, or in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. I am your lay leader, Lisa Conger, and with me this morning is our guest speaker, Liz Moore, Executive Director of the Peace and Justice Action League, also known as PJALS. I will more formally introduce her prior to her presentation. And I just have a couple of announcements. First of all, Deb is not able to be with us this morning, and uh, Marianne Winniford has, decided, has kindly opted to help us with that. And I was reminded that people have not returned their surveys, and so if you would 
kindly re return the surveys you should have received in your emails this last week. That would be great. So please take a few moments now to greet one another and say hello to someone you haven't met yet. Thank you. We'll have more time to greet one another and visit over coffee or tea after, the social, after our service today at the social hour. We now turn from our informal greeting of one another to formally begin our service by lighting our chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the symbol of our unity and solidarity, of our openness and inclusion, of our community and individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone, and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world, and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth, wherever truth has been lost. Our opening reflection this morning is a poem I wrote in 2005 which I think speaks much to the themes of this morning's service. It was inspired by a piece of art I saw in a gallery, a gallery showing of art by visually impaired artists. This was an abstract piece that made me think of a washing machine with dominant colors of red, white, and blue. It will all come out in the wash. The white t-shirt of peace the blue jeans of justice and the red bandana of liberty tumble together in the wash of our world. What is being laundered? The t-shirt is old and thin, stained now with the sweat of protesters bearing heavy signs and banners. The jeans are torn at the knees, worn through from working in the community garden and patched many times by calloused hands. The ba bandana is faded now, for miles of street marches, protecting the head of a worker or wiping away tears from a tired face. Can we ever come clean? These colors are bleeding in the hot water of war and political turmoil, bleached by the media through endless spin cycles of permanent press. Machine gone urgently berserk. The control knobs click only to the right. 
while the detergent of false cheer clouds and dims these fabrics of hope. These are the clothes we take comfort and pride in. They're holes made holy by our acts and by our allegiance to their ideals. Though they be tattered rags, we are called upon to wear them again and again until they are not simply garments hung out to dry, but prayer flags, prayer flags of truth and transformation. So this morning for Martin Luther King Day, we are singing some gospel songs, and that requires enthusiasm. <laughs> so uh, number 153, if you want to look in your books, or the, uh, it will be up here. we gather as a congregation there are always those who are with us in our minds and hearts and who we want to wrap in our love and care. We kindle light this morning for all those suffering in the war between Russia and the Ukraine. And any other names you may call out out loud, let us share a moment in silence embracing others who are here in our hearts this morning. You are welcome to say their names aloud as you are willing. Those named aloud and those remembered in the silence and all those who are suffering elsewhere in our world at this hour, we hold in our community of compassion. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering which sustains this community and its mission in the larger world.
Well, I just realized Todd's not here, Deborah's not here, Stephanie's not here. We could go crazy, guys. <laughs> so our religious education professional, Stephanie, is um, taking a class today for dance teachers to learn more about Russian, Hungarian, and Romanian folk dancing. Um, and so if all goes well, I understand that we might get to see some of the Hungarian dancing at our partner church Sunday uh, next month. But um, she did send along this story to be read for our Time for All Ages today. And this story is called The First and the Last. And it is uh, adapted, I changed a few of the words, by Martha Dallas. Um, so who here knows from experience that life is not fair? We know this, don't we? Life is just not fair. And I don't really think it ever has been, but what can we do? We generally just shrug and accept it. It's just not fair. But there was once a man who refused to just shrug off the injustices of the world. Life was not fair, but that was not okay with him. This man was a great and wise teacher and also a prophet. You've probably heard of him. Millions of people around the world are inspired by his teachings. His name was Jesus. Jesus stood up and spoke out and fought for fairness and for justice. In fact, he said something about this which is quite curious to me. He said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Yes, the last first and the first last. I'm not entirely sure what he meant by this, and my guess would be that there are several meanings this might have, but I've got an idea of one way we might understand it. We might understand it if we can think of what it feels like to be first and what it feels like to be last. So let's think about this to help us understand what it feels like to be first. Maybe you've had this experience yourself. Maybe you can imagine this. How does it feel, do you think, to be first, to be best, to be number one, to come out on top, to have the most? What do these things feel like? Anybody want to say? Good. Good. Great, scary. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some cautious people. Proud. Now, what about being last? What does that feel like, do you think? How does it feel to be the worst? To be on the bottom? To have the least? To have hardly anything, perhaps just crumbs, or nothing at all? What do you think that feels like? Envious. Envious. Sad. Sad. Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Last does not mean worst. Last does not mean worst. Thank you for sharing something with us about the feelings about being first and being last. You see, I think that fairness and justice might have a chance if the people who know what it feels like to be first because they've been first so much that they're very familiar with it. If these people can come to understand what it feels like, what it really feels like to be last, and I think the world might start to become a little more fair and balanced for everyone if the people who already know too well what it feels like to be last, because they are so often last, they often come in at the bottom and have the least. If these people can come to know what it feels like for a change, to actually come out on top, to be first for a change. I can imagine that if those who are usually last and those who are usually first could share the feelings in their experiences with one another, that each might begin to experience a transformation. I believe that when we can share our feelings with one another in a way that is kind and when we can listen to one another in trust and with compassion, 
that we can begin to transform one another on the inside. And when we start to be changed on the inside, we will begin to act differently in the world. We will act more and more and more for justice. Jesus believed that a just society was possible. It would, he taught us, create heaven right here on earth. And maybe heaven means being together to celebrate our feelings of joys of being first and sharing the sadness we might feel if we are feeling least, last, or lost. Thank you, Lynn. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which sustains this community. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You're right. <laughs> Now is the time for our meditation. I invite you now to settle in for our time of meditation in words and silence. This, is meditation. this meditation is adapted from Reverend, Reverend Alice Naisman. Find a comfortable, receptive posture. Close your eyes if you wish and take in some deep breaths. Let us simply breathe together as we hold our hearts open. Breathing in as our hearts fill with compassion. Breathing out as we pray for healing in our world and in our lives. Breathing in, opening ourselves to the transforming power of love. Breathing out as we pray for peace in our world and in our lives. Breathing in as we hold hope in our hearts breathing out as we pray for justice in our world and in our lives. May we know our strength, may we be filled with courage, may our love flow from us into the world. To All Get Free Together by Chris Crass. To become an anti-racist faith community, the key question for a white or white majority community is not, how do we get people of color to join our faith community? It is instead, how can we make a prolonged, spiritually rooted, engaged commitment to uprooting white supremacy within our community and take ongoing collective action to challenge it in society? Our goal is not to have white people sit alongside a person of color so as to affirm that those white people aren't racist. Our goal is to build and be part of collective, beloved community united to end structural oppression and unleash collective liberation in our faith communities, schools, neighborhoods, workplaces, and throughout society.
Our goal is to join hands across the division of racism in our faith and in our communities and affirm the humanity in each other. Our goal is to join our hearts and minds to the task of destroying the lie of white supremacy in every worldview, policy, law, institution, and governing body of our society. For our faith communities to be places of healing from the nightmare of racism that haunts people of color and white people. For our faith communities to be places of nourishment sustaining the multiracial struggles of our people to advance economic, racial, and gender justice. For our faith communities to be part of the continual process of working within the movement as part of the journey to end oppression in society. For our faith communities to raise our children of all backgrounds to be freedom fighters and practitioners of liberation values. Our goal is for our faith communities to be spiritually alive, learning from and contributing to liberation cultures and legacies. For our faith communities to be welcoming homes for people of all colors, sexualities, classes, ages, abilities, genders, and citizenship statuses. For our faith communities to regularly invite us into and prepare us for courageous action for collective liberation, held in loving community for the long haul. May our faith communities be active agents in the world to help us all get free together.
beautiful. Liz Moore began her activism in P. Giles Youth Group as a Deer Park High School student after looking up peace in the phone book. She worked as an organizer and educator in unions and community groups on issues including marriage equality, racial justice, and worker rights before returning to the organization that helped shape and define her work as a young activist. She is passionate about grassroots leadership development and supporting youth as leaders. In all that she does, Liz holds fast to the belief that everyday people have the power to build a just and nonviolent world. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and hosting me this morning. I want to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are on indigenous land, specifically that we are occupying the traditional lands of the Spokane people and other interior Salish peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. And I want to offer my respect to elders both past and present. In our Pajals community, we are committed to intentionally addressing the outcomes of the doctrine of discovery with the truth about the human beings who are already here and who continue to resist the impacts of ongoing colonization, fighting to sustain their culture, language, and people. We know it is insufficient to simply acknowledge the land that we occupy. We commit to centering the voices, leadership, and solutions of indigenous people in our communities and around the world. We stand in solidarity with indigenous people who are leading the fight to protect our planet's biodiversity across the globe. We encourage giving financial support to indigenous-led organizations here in the land of the interior Salish peoples to buy native and to integrate the essential voices of indigenous people in our lives all year long, because our words are only as meaningful as our actions. And I also want to acknowledge deadly and dehumanizing anti-black racism. In particular, I want to say the name of Kenan Anderson who died on January 3rd from cardiac arrest after being tased multiple times by Los Angeles police. He was a 10th grade English teacher and father of a six-year-old son who lived in Washington, D.C. and who was visiting family in Los Angeles. In the words of Ella Baker, as voiced by Sweet Honey in the Rock, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, until the killing of black men black mother's sons is as important as the killing of white men, white mother's sons. And I'm honored to be with you today on the weekend that we honor the life and vision of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm feeling very humble to be speaking about racial and economic justice today. And I'm holding the need to center and listen to directly impacted people, as well as holding the role of white people to engage in the work of racial justice and not just leave it to black, indigenous, and people of color. There are four key recognitions that frame my thinking and action, and action around racial justice. The first is that we live in a highly racialized society. Race matters in our society. When we look at any measure of social or economic well-being, income, education, health, criminal justice system involvement, etc., a racial fault line runs through every single one. There is not a single social indicator in which there is not a disparity based on race. 100%, including poverty. In our society, most of the time when we talk about racial justice or race or racism, we focus on individual bigotry or individual actions. But today, we're going to talk about the systems and how we intervene in those systems that continue to create results showing this racial fault line of disparity based on race. The second recognition is that we're all part of the picture. As a white person, I've been conditioned to view racism as something that happens to other people. Like, I'm walking through an art museum, and I'm studying a painting on the wall that's titled Racism in the US, and I can look at it from over here. But we're not looking at the picture, we're in the picture. The third recognition is that none of us asked for this. None of us are responsible for the past, but all of us are responsible for the present and the future. The fourth recognition is that as we talk about racial equity, racism always continues to play out. 
So I want to talk with you today about shifting from a stance of opposing racism because it's the right thing to do or because we want to be seen by ourselves or others as one of the good white people to instead a stance of understanding working for racial justice as a strategic imperative. What do I mean by that? Well, as we look around, we see that we live in the heart of hotly contested territory right here in Spokane. Whether we're talking about our neighbors without homes, reproductive rights, or the ballot measure for a new jail, our Spokane region is in struggle over who belongs, who is seen as worthy, who's seen as dangerous, and who's seen as deserving of safety and personhood. And it's not just local. The United States have been rocked by threats to democracy itself. And white nationalism, neo-fascism, and anti-democratic movements are on the rise here and around the world. The challenges that we face in our region are a microcosm of the challenges we face as a country and world community. And under the surface, just barely, if we scratch them, we can see clearly most of these conflicts are rooted in racism and economic injustice. Certain politicians exploit racist rhetoric to divide and distract, while they rig government and the economy for themselves and their big money donors. They get richer, the mass of us get poorer, and the power of government is turned against communities of color. But in our Pajal's community, we know everyday people can accomplish extraordinary things together. We know we can fight back and win. So together we are rejecting messages of racism, fear, and division from the reactionary rich to join together with people from all walks of life so we can ensure all our communities get good housing and better schools, not more barbed wire, and more living wage jobs, not just jails. So in order to do this, we use three principles that I'd like to share with you. First, in order to build a movement big and powerful enough to win and to transform structures of power, we need to use a strategy to tackle racism that is race explicit, but not race exclusive. We must be explicit about naming race and racism. The greedy few at the top are using racism strategically to point the finger of blame at black people, Muslims, and new immigrants with the goal of dividing us so that they can defund our schools, attack health care, attack our bodily autonomy, and more, so that they can increase their own power and line their own pockets. They're using dog whistle messaging with words that work like code, and they're also using what we call foghorn messaging, which is not subtle at all. We have to have, therefore, a, an explicit strategy to counter the strategic racism of the greedy few. That means building our collective skill and willingness to name race and to name racism. It means consciously choosing to make decisions in ways that explicitly consider racial equity, the last becoming the first, the first becoming the last. I think, I think that's how Jesus might have talked about what we call equity, actually. Uh, to explicitly and consistently listen to impacted people, to pay attention to disparities, and to create specific strategies to address and remove barriers, to analyze the potential impact of decisions, and to build in accountability measures to see if we're having the impact we intended to have. And it means that naming race is not enough. We also have to name class, gender, and other ways that systems of oppression exploit us and divide us. But because we are so strongly conditioned not to talk about race and racism, we have to be explicit about naming it. So race explicit but not race exclusive is one key strategic principle. A second strategic principle is to focus on impact, not intention. Folks may have heard this very simple idea before that for me was a, a light bulb shift. Focusing on impact allows us to deepen our understanding on how race and racism are playing out in situations despite good intentions. Systemic racism will continue to thrive regardless of the intention behind a policy or practice. It's not the intention that's the question. It matters much more to address the impact on people and communities of color. Sometimes people talk about the example of if I step on your toe and I didn't mean to, I still stepped on your toe. So the impact is your toes hurt, whether or not I meant to do it. And that's, that's a similar principle. It matters what's the impact of what it is that we're doing. 
A third strategic principle, and the one I want to focus on the most, is to tie our racial equity work to our mission or our purpose, not just to morality. We know that organizations and communities struggle to integrate racial equity into their work, and often the racial justice work can get lost if the only push for it is from a few people who believe this work is the right thing to do. As we know, racism plays a role in every sector and every kind of setting. So in order to advance a race equity culture, we need to move beyond a few good intentions and connect race equity work to our organizational mission. We will not be successful unless we pursue racial equity. So an example that's easy to look at is thinking about the Spokane School District, whose mission is educational excellence for everyone. Well, it's very easy to see that that mission of educational excellence for everyone cannot be achieved without addressing the institutional policies and practices that negatively impact students of color. It's just not possible. Similarly, our mission at Pajals is to build a just and nonviolent world. That mission is impossible to achieve without addressing the ways that institutional and structural racism create injustice and violence. Without addressing the ways that uh, race is used to manipulate support for war. Without addressing the ways that race is used to manipulate support for military spending that leaves uh, poor and communities of color resourceless without addressing the ways that the goodness of white women is used to manipulate um, uh, the drive uh, against bodily autonomy for women. So in our Pajals community, we're committed to naming racial justice as a strategic imperative for our organization. The more that we recognize and communicate how the reasons for centering racial justice are imperative for our mission, vision, and organizational values and strategies, the more critically important it feels to everyone in the organization at every level. And as that commitment deepens and expands, our work becomes more powerful and more effective. Here's an example of how that works in practice. Our organizing priorities are based on member surveys and decided by our steering committee. And our priorities continue to be ending mass incarceration and systemic racism in our city county criminal legal system, countering white nationalist organizing, uh, education for action on racial justice and grassroots organizing, and our Young Activist Leaders Program. And let me divert from the main topic for a moment to say that we're now hiring youth organizer interns uh, to participate in and help run our Young Activist Leaders Program. So please talk to me about that if you want information about it or find it on our website, peacejustice.org. Last year, now I'm back on topic, last year we launched a great, a very exciting new program called Building Organizing Leadership Development, or BOLD, which is really about advancing all of these organizational priorities. In BOLD, volunteers complete a five-part academy on race and class, how they operate together, and effective ways to talk about them. And then volunteers go talk to strangers about race, class, and politics, break a lot of rules all at once. We use a method called deep canvassing, which is proven effective around the country. It really comes down to having real conversations about taboo topics to engage people in voting and other ways to make our voices heard collectively. In the Bold Academy, we learn about dog whistle politics, and I'm going to quote from Ian Haney Lopez to go into this because it's such a key, a key concept to understand. Dog whistle politics allows politicians to use words like codes. You know, if you think of a dog whistle, right? Humans can't hear it, but dogs can, so it's a signal to a particular audience. So dog whistle politics means politicians are using words like codes to promote social hatreds, especially but not only racism, while pretending that they honor equality. A common example we hear nationally and locally is to talk about criminals or crime, which plays on anti-black racist stereotypes due to our implicit racist conditioning. Dog whistle politics use racism and hate to manipulate support for political agendas that put us all at risk while turning the power of government against communities of color. Ian Haney Lopez explains it's essential to be explicit to counter dog whistle racism. This is a long quote. Racial division is the most powerful weapon wielded by the right. Pretending not to notice that weapon guarantees defeat. Pretending not to notice that weapon guarantees defeat. Take climate change. 
Coke Industries is the largest privately held petrochemical conglomerate in the United States, and their owners, the Koch brothers, have led the fight to limit environmental protection laws. But how did they do that, especially during the Obama administration, when the Obama administration promised a new day for protecting the planet? The Koch brothers funded the Tea Party movement. Opposition to Obama built around fear of a black president and hysteria about Muslims, immigrants, and African Americans. In other words, the main tactic of the leading industrial polluters has been to fund racial anxiety and outrage. I'm just going to say that again. <laughs> I think that point is often missed. The main tactic of the leading industrial polluters has been to fund racial anxiety and outrage. If greedy elites can see clearly that racial division consistently defeats those of us demanding that the government work for people and the planet, shouldn't we also notice that and have a strategy to combat it? So our next round of the Bold Academy starts in March, and you're invited to be part of it. I should say that signing up for the Academy doesn't mean you have to do the canvassing. It just means you're qualified to do the canvassing. Bold is very important this year when we are facing the Kearns French countywide ballot measure in November to fund to raise sales tax to fund a new jail. And you may already know that our Spokane County Jail is, like all jails, the most effect the most expensive and least effective way to achieve community safety and wellness. That African Americans are two percent of the county population, but twelve percent of the jail population. Native Americans are less than 2% of the county population, but 7% of the jail population. 70% of the people who are in the jail are there pre-trial because they can't afford bail. This systemically racist and classist institution must not be allowed to expand. And I have no doubt that this m ballot measure will be a centerpiece of the city races for mayor and council president, which will also be this year which with certain politicians and wealthy donors using this old tried and true dog whistle racism, strategically playing on our fears and prejudices to manipulate vote voters in order to rig our economy and line their own pockets, to build their own power. So having shared these four recognitions, these three strategic principles and a snapshot of our Pajal's work, I'd like to finally share a few reflection, reflections from my own learning journey and my own anti-racist development. First uh, is the principle of relationship before task. In our dominant white supremacy culture, the norm is to focus on getting stuff done, the task or the ask, get the sign-ons, go to the meeting, do the thing, get, the, get them to do the thing, uh, before and without building any kind of relationship. If we use that approach with communities of color, if we use that approach in racial justice work, if we use that approach in movement building, it's usually a form of extracting value. Just like mining extracts what's valuable and then leaves this unhealthy, toxic stuff behind. So relationship before task, both in terms of priority and in terms of sequential order, is a shift from leading with asking people of color to join our projects to instead showing up ourselves consistently when we see an opportunity or a request. It means not making our allyship conditional on how we are received. It means building a track record of being trustworthy before asking a person of color to join what we're doing. Second, I've learned from an approach called conscious use of self. And it's kind of an odd phrase, but it means discerning when it makes sense for me to speak based on the entirety of who I am and what positions I hold and how I'm socialized and how people see me and all the relationships that exist, right? When, is, when does it make sense for me to speak? When does it make sense for me to take action? When does it make sense for me not to? It means learning to hear feedback without defensiveness, but instead, if you can imagine, with actual curiosity, which I would say I've learned, but I am learning constantly how to um, hear feedback without defensiveness, but instead with actual curiosity. And it also means understanding that white people shouldn't need to be stars or heroes for our racial justice work. To quote Ella Baker again, we can be just one in a number as we stand against tyranny. Not that we play small, but that we show up and do what we can without seeking glory. 
And third, uh, I am learning the principle of acting from commitment, uh, not from perfectionism. At my very first racial, racial justice training in you know, the mid-90s, trainers Tema Oken and Kenneth Johnson told us that we can't just plan on being perfect allies. We have to be committed even knowing we will make mistakes. Horrifying, excruciating information for me <laughs> because perfectionism was deep inside my conditioning as my just, just be good at it, just be perfect at it, just don't make mistakes. How about that? Turns out you can't, it's actually not how that works, but it's so soothing to think that you can just stop making mistakes and go forward. But what I've learned um, through my work on racial justice is that my work as a white person for racial justice is not a linear process. It's a lot more like a spiral where I try something based on my best effort to be strategic. All the information I can gather, all the relationships I can build, I take a step that I think makes sense based on my best assessments and information. When those, some of those, mis those actions are mistakes or when they're harmful, when I screw up, I get feedback, either spoken or experiential. And I do what I can to learn, and I do what I can to repair harm that I have done as long as it may take, which sometimes is a decade or more. While continuing my own individual or organizational work in the meantime, because my commitment is not contingent on making mistakes. My commitment is to learn and to figure out how to do the best that I can. And then fourth, which is really connected to all of these, I'm learning to be fierce against oppression, which honestly, I've been doing that for a while, fierce against oppression, but also loving with myself and my comrades. Gritting our teeth and tensing up and charging forward works in certain situations, but we can also access a range of ways of being that make learning easier, that make risk-taking easier, that create more internal spaciousness, that help us show up with less shame when we make mistakes, that allow us more joy in our movement building. And what could be more strategic than that? So to close on that note, I'd like to share some words from Paul Kivel. We move towards healing, love, interdependence, and justice. Love yourself. Love your body. Love your sexuality, gender expression, and gender identity. Love your sexual orientation and those it leads you to. Value all forms of diversity. Recognize multiple truths. Act cooperatively. Don't proselytize. Be humble, expand the possibilities, reject duality, challenge hierarchy, withhold condemnation, honor alternative paths, let go, live harmoniously with nature, work for restorative and transformative justice, live simply, extend your circle of caring to all people, Extend your circle of caring to all life. Recognize the spirit in all things. Use words responsibly. Find pleasure and joy in your life. Return the land to native peoples. Live lightly in the world. Align and move with the rhythm of the seasons. Remember that children are sacred. Remember that children are sacred. Align and move with the rhythm of the seasons. Live lightly in the world. Return the land to native peoples. Find pleasure and joy in your life. Use words responsibly. Recognize the spirit in all things. Extend your circle of caring to all life. Extend your circle of caring to all people. Live simply. Work for restorative and transformative justice. Live harmoniously with nature. Let go. Honor alternative paths. Withhold condemnation. Challenge hierarchy. Reject duality. Expand the possibilities. Be humble. Don't proselytize. Act cooperatively. Recognize multiple truths. Value all forms of diversity. 
Love your sexual orientation and those it leads you to. Love your sexuality, gender expression, and gender identity. Love your body. Love yourself. Thank you. Okay, another gospel song, number 116, I'm on my way. Please rise as you are willing and able. Our benediction today is a piece by Jim McGaw called Go in Peace, Seeking Justice. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go in mindless oblivion. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go without challenging yourself or others. When I say go in peace, I don't mean go in utter ease and comfort. When I say go in peace, I mean go in peace, seeking justice. I mean go in peace, committed to equal rights and opportunities for all. When I say go in peace, I mean go in the peace that is created when together we build communities of true solidarity, deep compassion, and fierce, unrelenting love. Go in peace. Amen. Blessed be. Salam. Alaikum. And Shalom.